Revelation chapter 8, and in this teaching series that we've entitled Jesus Full of Mercy and Justice. And today, I do believe you'll see both of those in play in God's perfect plan for the world that he's created. You know, one of the most predominantly clear characteristics of God, and this just isn't in the New Testament, but, but throughout his word, is his long suffering, long suffering. You know, I grew up in church and I remember a guest speaker who would often frequent coastline golf breeze by the name of Gail Irwin. Gail Irwin, does anyone remember Gail? Handful of people, okay. Well, this is kind of a picture of him. It's kind of a cartoon, but that's kind of how I think of Gail Irwin. He's a real human being, flesh and blood. But he had such a wonderful, almost like slapstick approach to communicating God's word in a respectful way, a memorable way, an engaging way, a comical way. But he used to give this description, and I was so blessed, stoked, excited to hear what Mark read this morning, because it's the same description of our father that Gail used to communicate in a way that Gail only could. But this is what he would say. And in describing who God was, he would often say that God, his name, he had defined himself in a way to Moses like this, compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And I always remembered that, that, that little like, slow to anger, abounding. And so when I, when I thought of that, I thought that would be a fun thing to do this morning as a group, as a community, as a church, to remember who God is. So we're going to do this together. Now, we're not going to say the whole thing, but what we're going to say is slow to anger, abounding in mercy and faithfulness. You did the test run. Let's do it together one time for real. Ready? This is who our God is. Our God is slow to anger, abounding in mercy and faithfulness. Yes, that's who God is. I love that description of our God. Why do I share that this morning? I think it's really important. It's the framework of the eighth chapter of the book of Revelation. You know, in the book of First Peter, Peter spoke of this characteristic of God. I'll, I'll put it up on the screen for you. He says this in First Peter 3, starting in verse 8. But you, but you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. He stands outside of time. He's different than us. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. This is the heart of God that you must know. He goes on to say, but the day of the Lord will come unexpectedly as a thief, then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire and the earth and everything on it. What does he say? It will be found to deserve judgment. See, the book of Revelation is not the first time we see this dynamic of God being faithful and just and slow to anger. We see that throughout all of Scripture. But there is coming a time where God, because he's God, because for him a thousand years is like a day, a day is like a thousand. He's outside of time, outside of space. He's the righteous judge. Because he's holy, because he's perfect, because he's complete, there will be justice. It's like he waits as long as possible to do so. Why? Because he's lazy, doesn't have anything better to do. For, he forgets about you. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed. That's his heart. Peter says, don't forget this, dear friends. Now, this morning, 
It's our goal, it's our hope, it's our intent to walk through the entirety of the eighth chapter of the book of Revelation. And I want us to keep this in mind because this morning we are going to see judgment, but we're also going to see mercy. You may remember that in the book of Revelation, there, there's different sets of judgment that are described. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. In chapter 6, we saw the first of the six seals opened. And, and today, in chapter 8, Jesus, known as the Lamb, well, he opens up that seventh seal, which gives way to what we'll see today, the first four trumpets. And we'll see, as horrific as they are, listen, they're only partial. They're partial, only striking a third of what they could. Why? Because even in this chapter, God is doing what he's always done, seeking to use judgment because he's just and right, yes, but also giving opportunity and calling for people to respond, to bring a warning, to bring a rebellious people to a place of repentance place where their minds align with God in the truth and their lives follow suit with that. See, one author put it this way in considering all of what happens in chapter eight that we'll see this morning is that God actually spares more than he smites. That's not a word that we use too often nowadays, is it? Man, I was just smitten. Well, I'm smitten maybe. Okay, I digress. Anyway, <laughs> see, here's, this, is the tr this is true also of the time that we live in now. God actually spares this age of grace. And he does so in the age that is to come, the time that is to come. This time that we're studying this fall, chapters 6 through 19 are describing this time known as the Great Tribulation. So let's jump in. Let's look at verse 1. And if you're still with me, let me know by saying God is abounding in mercy and faithfulness. Okay. <laughs> verse 1, verse 1. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal on the scroll, there was silence throughout heaven for about half an hour. Now, I think that when most people think of heaven, they think of something that's quiet, serene, soft. You know, you can actually YouTube heaven sound effect and you'll actually get something like this that'll probably come up in your search engine. That kind of feels and sounds and gives that element of, oh, I've reached a place of heaven, right? That, that's what YouTube thinks, I guess. It's what, it's what many people initially think of when they think of heaven. They just think of something like, well, I just kind of, it's finally soothing. Do you remember what we saw in chapter 7? Shouting is what we saw in chapter 7. Shouting that said, salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne from the Lamb. There's shouting, and from chapter 7, there's tremendous singing. It's recorded for us in that chapter that everyone is singing amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever, amen. I love what Pastor Greg Laurie says about this. He says, heaven, heaven is rocking. Heaven is hopping. Redeemed people and angels are running a thousand different directions serving the Lord. There's worship. There's announcements being made. And there are victory shouts going up every time someone on earth comes to know Jesus. There's singing. There's shouting. There's work being done on behalf of the Lord. There's people coming to know him. It's not this place that you're just like, oh, just hanging out. That's not what it is. You know, one of the authors that I would recommend to you as a, as a great guy with great biblical insights, not just on the book of Revelation, but the entirety of God's word is a pastor by the name of Skip Heitzig. And I wanted to share something that he said about this point of this pause that we see in heaven. He said this, some commentators have suggested that the half hour of silence in heaven just before the trumpets blow represents God's final 30 minutes of grace in his signal final chance, saying, I'm about to pour out judgment, but before I do so, I'm going to wait for just another moment. 
just half an hour. God is never in a hurry to judge anyone. One of the Lord's main attributes is his long suffering, patient nature. He's not anxious to judge, not willing that any should perish. And he references the prophet Ezekiel, insisted that the Lord takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. In fact, he says, God has waited for thousands of years to bring this judgment, issuing warning after warning to a world that has consistently rejected the gospel message. But now finally, the long wait is over. God's patience and long-suffering have come to an end, and the time for judgment has arrived. Do you see mercy in chapter 8? You see it in the very first verse. The Lamb opens that seventh seal, and then there's just a pause. Now, some would say, finally, that scroll, that deed to the earth, as many believe this seal opens, is visibly seen by all in heaven, and they see what's about to come, and there's just silence, shock and awe of what's about to happen. And that may also be coupled with God's patience and long-suffering and desire for people to repent. You see, in your life and in mine, This is not just something that will happen in the future. This is something God is doing right now. If you've walked through life for any length of time and you have a shred of self-awareness or honesty with yourself, you go, I know there's areas in here that need work. I know there's areas in my life that God is calling me to change, to surrender to him. But man, it kind of seems like he's just... He's cool with whatever I'm doing. Don't ever, ever think that God's delays are his okays for things that you know they're not okay. His delays are evidences of his grace. See, listen, this was burned into my brain as a young student. Sin is not bad because it's forbidden. Sin is forbidden because it's bad. You have a heavenly father who warns, instructs, calls you to live and behave and believe in a certain way because it's best for you. There's an enemy out there that seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. And sin, boy, it's pleasurable for a season. But don't confuse God's delays of judgment for his okays of beliefs, behaviors, or lifestyles. When's the best day to repent yesterday. But now, you know, now is the best day to come to the Lord, confess sin, and give everything to him. See, there's this pause in heaven. I think it's picturesque of the mercy and long-suffering of God. He's not willing that any would perish. Listen, God is not against you. He's for you. There's a deceiver who's against you, and he would seek to see your life reduced to ash, but not our God. Remember, he's abounding in mercy and faithfulness, right? Let's look at what happens next in verse 2. John says, I saw seven angels who stand before God, and they were given seven trumpets. Now, the mention of these seven angels with these seven trumpets is striking. When we think of angels, or at least for me, I don't want to speak for you, but I can tend to think in like cartoon or figurine pictures, right? And I think it's safe to say that for many of us, angels are not necessarily commonplace in all of our conversations. I mean, Monday through Thursday here on campus, our church staff gathers to watch the the Daily in the Word devotional. We share time of announcements and prayer requests for individuals in the life of the church, and then we get together in groups and pray. Pray for one another, pray for the fellowship, pray for what we just learned through our daily in the Word devotion. And I have yet to be in a circle where someone from morning staff would say, well, you know, an angel just spoke to me last night, and everyone's like, oh yeah, sure, that happens all the time. Like for us in the 21st century, angels can be seen as something like, well, it's almost like a figurine that was on my grandmother's shelf, or it's like, or it's like some mystical thing. But for those to whom this was written, angels were not all that unfamiliar. 
Verse 2 indicates that these are the, there are these high-ranking angels involved. And what we can tell from all of Scripture is not only are angels real, but they have ranks. Remember Daniel chapter 10. A low-ranking angel needed the archangel Michael to help him. When John the Baptist's birth was to be announced, God sent Gabriel, another one of those archangels, to announce it to Zacharias, his father. Psalm 103 shows us that angels serve God and carry out his commands. In Acts chapter 12, God sent angels to answer prayers. And in Psalm 34, the word tells us that the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. God uses his messengers, these angels, as agents of service and protection but also judgment. Remember the account in Genesis 19 where Lot is living in that area of Sodom and Gomorrah? Who does God send to bring judgment? I'll give you a hint. It rhymes with mangels. <laughs> Angels, yes. This is something consistent throughout Scripture. We see here that God uses these angels now with these seven trumpets. Trumpets. This is another thing that, at least for me, I don't want to speak for you, that I kind of maybe don't see the same way that those that first read this saw. When I think of angels, I can think of like, and I don't know how you say this word, is it New Orleans or Nolans? I don't know. But like jazz, right? That's what I think of. Or I think of like Charlie Brown's parents, right? Like wah, 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 wah. Like when I think of a trumpet, that's kind of like the images that come to my mind. For those that would have been hearing this letter read, that's not what would have come to their mind. See, trumpets are spoken of often throughout Scripture. In the book of Numbers, chapter 10, we know that they were used for three important purposes in the lives of God's people. They called God's people together. So when there's a trumpet blast, it's like, okay, God's got something to say. Also, they were used to announce war, and they were used to announce special times. Like in Exodus, a trumpet was sounded at Mount Sinai when the law was given. Or in 1 Kings, when the king was anointed and enthroned, a trumpet was blast. So in Revelation chapter 8, John sees angels. He goes, okay, these are God's messengers. They do his work, they protect, and they also bring judgment. There's trumpets. Okay, these are used to announce Times of war, call God's people together. These seven angels are God's instruments of judgment, and they're given these seven trumpets. And then we're given a description of heaven that would have resonated with these primarily Jewish believers that are reading and hearing this book read. Verse 3 says, Another angel with a gold incense burner came and stood at the altar. See, the tabernacle and the temple, these places of worship for God's people, had a golden altar before the veil, and it was used for burning incense. And burning incense on the altar was a picture of prayers ascending to God. And verse 3 continues to unpack this. Look at verse 3. It says, And a great amount of incense was given to him, to mix with the prayers of God's people as an offering on the gold altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense mixed with the prayers of God's holy people ascended up to God from the altar where the angel had poured them out. You see, on the altar there, this incense is mixed with the prayers of God's people, God's saints, some translations may read. And you may wonder, saints, well, that's not me. You know, I don't have the figurine. I haven't done the, the miracle in my life. You know, very simply, a simple way to remember what a saint is, uh, someone once shared it with me this way, that there's saints and then there's ain'ts, right? Like all saints are are individuals whose belief and faith and hope and life have been given to Jesus. He has sanctified you and made you one of his own. So for saints, there's those that belong to them, to Jesus, and those that ain't, Right? Well, what are these prayers that are being mixed with this incense? Listen, we don't definitively know, but do you remember the prayer from chapter 6 where God's people prayed this? 
O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge the people who belong to this world and avenge our blood for what they have done to us? See, we'll see in verses 5 and 6 this interesting, insightful correlation between God's justice and your prayers. And this imagery, it, it kind of begs the question, what happens to our prayers when they leave our lips? And I would say this, that all depends I don't know that God hears all prayers in some sense. You say, what do you mean by that? Do you remember the story that Jesus told of the Pharisee and the tax collector that prayed in the temple? Let me read it to you from the Gospels. These are Jesus' words. He said, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. For I fast twice a week. I give to the tithes of, he of all that I possess. And I'm in a small group. That's what he said. No, he didn't say that. But like. <laughs> and then Jesus said, then the tax collector standing far off, who would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me a sinner. And Jesus said that God heard the sinner, but not the Pharisee. Why? Well, did you catch that in the text? That he prayed thus within himself. Pastor Greg Laurie said this. I thought it was really good. He said, the truth is, his prayers had nothing to do with God. They were little more than just self-congratulations. Just a presentation of his holiness, his righteousness in his eyes before others and above others. But God hears prayers of sincerity and humility. Do you know what? You qualify for that. Humble prayers, sincere prayers, prayers where you're honest and open before God. If you've ever read through the book of Psalms, that's who David was. Some mornings he's like, God, there's my enemy. Break the teeth in their mouth, Lord. Other times, he's like, God, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Other times, God, you're worthy of all praise. What does that show? Someone who's honest before the Lord. Listen, if you will get real with God, God will get real with you. These prayers that are mixed with the incense, God hears them. And so it begs this question, what happens to our prayers? If they're of sincerity, of humility, of integrity, you need to know this. I'm going to share three simple things with you that we can take away from this. Prayer is powerful. God hears your prayers. Think of 1 Samuel chapter 1. There's Hannah there who's barren, never had a child, and she seeks the Lord in sincerity and God blesses. Think of Joshua chapter 10. Joshua prays. He's in the midst of a battle, and the sun stood still. Think of Acts chapter 12. Peter's in prison. James has been killed. At that time, probably the leader of the church. The church is praying, and God, through an angel, delivers Pete. There is power in prayer. A second thing, though, to remember is that God's timing is not always our timing. Remember 1 Peter. He stands outside of time. The martyrs that we read about in chapter 6 were asking God, Oh God, how long until you avenge? G. Campbell Morgan would often say this, God's delays are not always his denials. Trust him with the timing in your life. And prayer... Prayer involves patience, persistence, perseverance. Psalm 27 says this, Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. See, and the third thing about prayer is this. God's will will be done. In our study, we're going to get to chapter 20, the millennial reign of Jesus. Jesus. 
And God will accomplish his will ultimately. His will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God is powerful. He's just. He's righteous. And this is what's so interesting to me. There's this correlation of God's people praying and then his justice. Look at verses five and six, how this relates. He says, the angel filled the incense burner with fire from the altar and then threw it down upon the earth. And thunder crashed and lightning flashed and there was a terrible earthquake. And then the seven angels with the seven trumpets prepared to blow with mighty blasts. You see, the Jews celebrated annually the Day of Atonement. And the high priest would put incense on the coals of the censer with the blood of the sacrifice and he would enter the Holy of Holies. And here the angel is putting the incense on the altar presented as the prayers before God. And then he cast down those coals from the altar to the earth. What's happening here? God's judgment is coming. Anyone have a garage door opener? Anyone ever had kids in the home? Anyone ever like as a kid, maybe you heard this. I think my wife shares this bit of information. You know, we're going to let dad deal with this when he gets home. You know how my kids know when I'm coming home? The garage door starts coming up. They hear it. That's kind of the dynamic that's happening here. The trumpet's about to blast, you know. Now, I don't throw down, uh, you know, lightning and thunder, but, you know, they're hearing that, okay, it's coming. That's the anticipation that's happening in heaven. Wearsby puts it this way. Like it or not, the prayers of God's people are involved in the judgment that he sends. The throne and the altar are related. The purpose of prayer, it has often been said, is not to get man's will done in heaven, but to get God's will done on earth, even if that will involves judgment. True prayer is serious business. So we had better not move the altar too far from the throne. There's that beautiful concept that you need to know this, that God hears you. He sees. Trust him in his time to work out his will in his way on the day that he has appointed to do so. You know, this morning, we've seen a pause in heaven. We've seen how powerful prayer is. We're going to look in just a moment at the punishment that's about to befall the earth. These first four trumpet judgments are brought upon the environment. It's really interesting. And very interestingly, they're very similar to the plagues that came upon Egypt during the time of Moses. We've considered this morning this pause that we see in verse 1. And that evidence is God's grace. It's like he's just extending a little bit more time for repentance. We see this correlation of God's people praying and how it relates to God's will being accomplished. Now what we're going to see is these trumpets that are going to be blasted, sounded, and judgment is going to be brought upon the environment. But I have to ask a question here just before we see this. Is everyone okay? Do you like, need to see a picture of a bunny or anything or just before we get into this? You know, I found this was interesting. If you Google cutest dog picture on the internet, this actually pops up. I, it's very interesting. This has nothing to do with anything that we're about to look at, but I thought, you know, about this time, we may need to see something cute or weird or just bizarre. So there we go. Nothing to do with anything we're talking about. Verse seven, the first angel blew his trumpet and hail and fire mixed with blood were thrown down on the earth. And one third of the earth was set on fire. One third of the trees were burned and all green grass was burned. The earth is now struck with God's judgment. Hail and fire mixed with blood. This is kind of reminiscent of the seventh plague that God sent to Egypt. It's also what Joel talked about in chapter two, where he promised blood and fire will come. One author put it this way. This ultimately means that global warming is coming in a very real way. 
And this trumpet judgment targets one third of the earth's vegetation, crops and forests. That will wreak havoc upon the world's food supply and the global economy. One third of the earth's trees and all the green grass will be gone. Verse 8, the second angel blew his trumpet and a great mountain of fire was thrown into the sea and one third of the water in the sea became blood. One third of all things living in the sea died and one third of all the ships on the sea were destroyed. The second trumpet blasts the seas and the oceans, one third of the water. And the water covers three fourths of the earth's surface. That water becomes like blood. Again, you can see that parallel of God's judgment upon those that rejected God in Egypt. And that first plague of water turning to blood. Now, it's possible that this could be red tides, this, this blood-like look caused by billions of dead microorganisms poisoning the water. Who knows if it's real blood or if it looks like, we don't know. But we know that God is bringing judgment. And in verse 8, John describes like this, this great mountain burning with fire thrown into the sea. Now, most likely, this isn't a literal mountain, but he's using first century language to describe what he sees. This could be a, a meteor or an asteroid. Whatever it is, it'll bring devastating results upon the planet. One third of the water, one third of all living things in the water, one-third of the shipping commerce destroyed. And just as with the first trumpet, the world is going to begin to wobble. Verse 10, the third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from the sky, burning like a torch. It fell on one-third of the rivers and the springs of the water, and the name of that star was Bitterness. It made one-third of the water bitter, and many people died from drinking the bitter water. All sources of fresh water impacted. One author said this, in verse 10, the description of the falling star named Wormwood might be describing a devastating exchange of nuclear weaponry. The scenario we read about here actually parallels what scientists call a nuclear winter, which follows nuclear warfare with more, I think that should say, debilitating effects than the battle itself. When I thought about that, it was interesting because two weeks ago I read an article in USA Today, that, and this was the title, Nuclear War Between U.S. and Russia Would Leave Five Billion Dead From Hunger. Like, we don't know what this star is named bitterness or in other translations known as wormwood. But I thought this was an interesting insight that this very well could be the fallout that you would see from nuclear war. And this article that was just published two days or two weeks ago, it had new, well, new conclusions from a recent study that I wanted to share with you. I'm just going to read this to you. It says this. The article reads, as many as 5 billion people worldwide, 75% of the global population would die from famine and hunger after a nuclear war between U.S. and Russia, a new study says. The detonation of a nuclear weapon would cause massive fires and inject soot into the atmosphere, blocking sunlight from reaching the surface and limiting food production. And many of us, okay, we've heard this before. But Alan Robach, a professor of climate science at Rutgers University and co-author of the study, he's quoted as saying this, this research is the first of its kind. No one has done this calculation before. No one has tried to calculate the numbers of people who would die. And he says, this is a real concern as there are still nine countries with more than 12,000 nuclear warheads among them. Why do I share this? You know, for centuries, Critics, and even sometimes Christians, when they would read the book of Revelation, it'd be kind of like, well, looked at with a raised eyebrow or held in suspect. How could anything of what John is recording here actually be taken in somewhat of a literal fashion? 
Couldn't see how what was written could actually become a reality. But today, two weeks ago, in a nationally publicized article, they say, actually, if something like this were to happen, you could see how there's some parallels to what you see in God's word. We're living in a time where I truly believe that what we're experiencing more than anything is God's long suffering, his patience, this age of grace where the primary work of his spirit is calling those who do not know him to come to know him, to repentance, calling believers to wake up like the apostles would write this over and over again in the New Testament, not to live in the dark, but to walk in the light. To treat one another with love, care, tenderness, forgiveness, just as God has treated us. See, what God is doing right now in this age of grace is he's calling us tenderly, lovingly to respond to him, to repent. But there will come a day like we're reading now where that patience will come to its end. And God, because he's God, must judge sin. And the book of Revelation, chapter 6 through 19, shows us, gives us descriptions of what that time will look like. Verse 12, he says, The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and one-third of the sun was struck, one-third of the moon, one-third of the stars, and they became dark, and one-third of the day was dark, and also one-third of the night. The sun, the moon, the stars, darkness. Jesus spoke of this. Look at, listen to the words of Jesus coming from the Gospel of Luke. There will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. These first four trumpets that these angels, these messengers of God, they're blasting these trumpets and God's punishment, his judgment, his justice is being poured out upon the earth, the atmosphere, sea, sky, water. And after this tremendously horrific judgment, what happens next? There's a proclamation. Look at verse 13. Then I looked and I heard a single eagle crying loudly as it flew through the air, terror, terror, terror to all who belong to this world because of what will happen when the last three angels blow their trumpets. There's a proclamation from what appears to be an eagle. Some translations say an angel. Some suggest that this could be the eagle-like creature that John saw earlier in the book of Revelation in chapter 4. But what this creature is saying is that the Lord has already poured out punishment upon the earth, and what's to come is even worse. See, even in the midst of these trumpets being blast, God sends this creature to continue to call people, listen, wake up. What's coming is even worse than what's come. Why? Why does he give this warning? Because even at this late date, God is still giving time and opportunity for people to respond to him. See, God is holy and just. He will bring, as we're reading here, justice. This is a theme throughout the Bible. But it's also true. It's, it's, it's as if he waits as long as possible to do so because he does not want any to be destroyed. Why will all this happen? Because the world has pushed away the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ for those that don't want him, 
See, God has been so very patient, but the day is coming where his patience will run out. And you see this morning in this chapter, this pause in heaven, the impacts of the prayers of God's people, the punishment that's coming to those who stay in their sin and this proclamation that more is to come. So what's the response? The response is repentance. The response is to give your life to Jesus. You remember last week we shared a little bit of the purpose of the Great Tribulation. To wake up a nation and to shake up a people group. Last week we saw that the nation of Israel in chapter 7, there's these 144,000 who awaken to the truth of who Jesus is and they just become these on-fire evangelists for Jesus. You know, this judgment that we read of here in Revelation chapter 8, I think in the same way is intended for us this morning to awaken us to what's really priority in life. Is it the lines in the grass? You know, just making sure every, every week that I mow those lines, they're perfect. Well, they're all going to burn. Remember, we just read it, Revelation 8. No. <laughs> My point is, I, you know, you can sometimes focus life on things that you go, you know, is this temporal or eternal? Now, listen, we steward those things that are temporal because God's given, to them, given them to us to enjoy and they're of his good pleasure. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But I think there's this dynamic as we read Revelation 8 this morning to frame the totality of our lives around what really matters. And it's so easy to get lulled into the cultural values that are surround us all the time. And just as this time literally will wake up the nation of Israel, will shake up a people group from all over the world to come to know Jesus, I think in this time and in this place, this insight should bring us to a place where we repent before him. Where we no longer walk in darkness, but walk in light. Where we let go of bitterness and embrace forgiveness. Where we walk in grace and not anger. See, our Heavenly Father, as Gail Irwin would say, is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger. That's who he is. He's slow to anger and abounding <laughs> in mercy and faithfulness. That's who he is. And this final judgment that's coming, well, now is the time to turn away from sin and turn to Jesus. The Apostle Paul put it this way in the book of 2 Corinthians. He said, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then just ignore it. For God says, at the right time, I heard you. On the day of salvation, I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation.